God is not a God that plays favorites. God is not a God that is partial. He is impartial. Jesus, when he came, it's important to look at how he treated people. He interacted with the poor. He interacted with the rich. He treated them both equally, both with value. So we have a lot to cover today. I'm going to talk to you this morning on how to treat people right. Um, Let me tell you a little bit of background of this, what's going on here. Most of the early church was made up of poor people. Um, Most of the people that came to faith in Christ early on the day of Pentecost in the early church was mostly poor people. So, you know, one of the things you learn about church is is that um, it costs money to buy buildings, it costs money to uh, keep the lights on, it costs, there's a lot of kind of financial, uh, there's a lot more financial to it than most people think, you know, it's, um, it's just, I don't know, our electric bill is something like eight, nine hundred dollars a month, I mean, that's just our electric bill, and then the, the, the what we t- paid up, keep the buildings, this is a lot that kind of goes into things, and you have the salaries here, which uh, I do believe that many of the early apostles got some form of pay as far as kind of their care for the church, they were paid to pray, they were paid to... Um, teach the people the gospel. So there's a lot of kind of that financial side that goes into it. So here you have this church that's loaded full of poor people, and then every once in a while you'd have a rich guy get saved and he'd come into the church. And look, let's all be honest. I mean, we all struggle with favoritism to an extent. I mean, we like some people more than others, and we kind of wrestle with these particular areas. And and we tend to be really, really impressed, especially in our culture, of, uh, we, we tend to be really impressed with people that make a lot of money. So people make a lot of money, then we tend to be impressed by them because we think that somehow that is the gauge of success. Well, this is not anything new. I mean, this has been really going on since the beginning of time. And so this was happening in the church. So what was happening is, is they'd have rich people come in or people that looked rich and they would get preferential treatment. They would say, hey, you know, you come sit here and and, uh, hey, you poor person, get out of the way, <laughs> you know. We got VIP seat, seat, seats here, kind of, so to speak. Um, and this, so this is what James is getting at here in James chapter 2. He's dealing with this issue of what we would call favoritism. Um, I think you can take it to a greatest extent, even racism, um, partiality, treating somebody different than you would treat somebody else. So what James is doing in this chapter is, is he's really teaching us how we should treat all men, but in particular, how we should treat people inside the church, how we should treat people, treat one another inside the church. So I'm going to walk through this uh, text, and I'm not going to read all the verses at once. I'll just read them and talk about them as we go along. So we're beginning in verse number one of James chapter two. It says this, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality. So number one When it comes to how do I treat people right, one, treat people the way Jesus treated people. Number one, treat people the way Jesus treated people. God does not show partiality. In fact, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17, Moses said this, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. So he's saying, look, a God is not a God that plays favorites. God is not a God that is, Im, that is, is partial. He is impartial. Jesus, when he came, it's important to look at how he treated people. He was not partial in how he treated people. Rather, he was impartial. So let's think about the different classes of people that Jesus interacted with. He interacted with the poor. He interacted with the rich. He treated them both equally, both with value. Um, the poor ha- have, are of a special concern to God, and there's a lot I'm going to talk about later, but he cared for the poor. He reached out to the poor. He fed the poor. He took care of the poor. Jesus did that when he was here. But he, on the flip side of that, didn't neglect the rich. 
Um, sometimes we make the rich our enemy. You say, well, the rich have a lot of money, so they're, they're not your enemy. They're the same people you are, in a sense, they just have more money than you have, okay? But they're not to be looked down on. Jesus treated them the same. Remember, there was a, when I was a kid, we, I, in Sunday school, I grew up with this, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee, do you guys remember that? If you went to Sunday school, that's a terribly, terrible song. Now we probably don't sing that anymore, because it's... Um, not politically correct, but, um, you know, he's a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He was a small person up in a tree, I guess would be the more cor- politically correct way. But, but what was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a rich guy, and Jesus noticed him. And Jesus said, hey, come, come down off that tree, and let's go to your house. And what did he do? He shared the gospel with him. I, I mean, he cared about Zacchaeus, who was a rich man. Jesus didn't discard this man because he was rich. Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. What does that tell you? Joseph of Arimathea was a rich guy that owned his own tomb, and he, he obviously had some kind of a relationship with Jesus. He had spent time with Jesus or gotten to know Jesus, and so what did Jesus do? What did Joseph do when Jesus died? He opened his tomb. He allowed Jesus to be buried in his tomb because they had a relationship. Jesus loved the poor, but he also loved the rich. Jesus was a Jew. He grew up a Jew. He grew up in a Jewish home. His mother and father were Jewish. He ministered mostly to the Jewish people, but Jesus loved the Gentiles too. One of the greatest stories in the Bible that you don't even, that most people who haven't even been to church know is the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan was not a Jew. Uh, Jesus was constantly reaching out to the Gentiles and, and, and concerned about the Gentiles. The woman at the well. Here was this woman who was immoral in a sense. She's on her fifth marriage. She's living with somebody that she's not married to. Yet Jesus cared about her, reached out to her who was not a Jewish woman, but a Gentile woman. And so Jesus cared about both the Jew and the Gentile. Jesus cared about the ignorant. In fact, the Bible says that some of the people that God uses the greatest are those who are considered ignorant. In fact, the early apostles were not looked at in great regard. In fact, the religious leaders of the day said about the early apostles, these are unlearned and ignorant Galileans. Who are these guys? Yet he also did have a relationship with the learned. Um, John 3, 3, maybe one of the best chapters in all of the Bible. John 3 is an interaction with a man by the name of Nicodemus who had, who had uh, curiosity about what it meant to be born again. We get the whole doctrine of salvation in that chapter because a learned guy was trying to get his mind around what it meant to be saved. Jesus cared about the influential, he cared about the nobodies, he cared about the learned, he cared about the ignorant, he cared about the Jew, he cared about the Gentile, he cared about the rich, and he he cared about the poor. And so what James is saying is, if we say that we're Christians, one of the things that ought to dis- that make us distinct is that we care for all men as well. We do not show partiality. So anybody comes into our church, they should all be treated equally. And that's the emphasis that James is getting at. He's saying we should treat all people the way that Jesus treated people. If we are Christians, if we bear his name, this is how we should treat people. I love what John MacArthur said. He said this about Jesus, he, uh, about God. God is not interested in you because you are poor or because you don't look so good or because you don't have so many clothes or because you have a common job or you don't have any degrees or any reputation or any social standing. He is not disinterested in you because of what you lack, nor is he interested in you because of what you possess. And frankly, we who belong to God and say that we are children of God should certainly manifest those same characteristics. We should not treat somebody with partiality because they come into our church and they look better than somebody else. That's not how Jesus treated people. Jesus loved beautiful people and ugly people. Jesus loved people who looked good and those who looked shabby. Jesus cared about all men, and we should do the same. And so we should not draw lines. We should not be impartial. We should treat all people as Jesus treated people. And that's the emphasis here in verse number one. Do not hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and then be impartial. That's not, those two things don't jive. 
Saying that I hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and at the same time having respects for persons is contradictory. That's the first emphasis he makes. So number two then he says in verses two through four, two through five, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, so he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of jewelry, he's got a lot of rings, he's got a, a Royals World Series ring on, you know, um, in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves? And this is the phrase I want you to get. And become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, so, so one is, how should I treat people? Church, how should I treat them? Treat them the way who treated them? Jesus, good, you're, you're, you're with me today. Two, um, don't make judgments quickly. The second thing he's talking about with people is don't make judgments quickly, okay? Now, the Bible is pretty clear that there comes a point in a relationship where I have to make a judgment call, okay? Um, there, are plenty time, there are plenty of times in the Bible where the Bible warns me that there are certain people that I should stay away from. All right, let me read a few of those. Proverbs 13 and verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. So what, what the writer of Proverbs is saying, don't hang around with fools because fools are going to make you look foolish because you're going to do what a fool does and you're going to make some mistakes. So don't walk with, instead of walking with fools, walk with wise men. So I have to make a judgment on somebody. I say, are you a fool or are you a wise man? I want to hang with you. I don't want to hang with you, okay? Um, Proverbs 14, 7, go from the presence of a foolish man. So that's, that's strong language, go. Same word in a sense that says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I'm supposed to go, I'm supposed to turn and run from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge, So, okay, you sound like you're contradicting yourselves, Mark, because you said God loves it. He does love everybody, but we're not supposed to hang out with everybody. Okay? There are certain people we need to stay away from. Let me give you a few more. Matthew 16, 16 and 70. This is a this is a whole chapter about church discipline. You got somebody in your church, they're they're um, not doing the right thing. You first should go to them, the Bible says. Then you should bring two or three witnesses with you and go to them and confront them in their sin. If they won't hear that, then you, the Bible says in verse 17 of Matthew 16, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him to be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. It's pretty strong language. Listen to this in Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren... Note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. That's pretty strong language, right? So I, I spend time talking to you and all you want to do is run down uh, the word of God, run down the leadership, run down the church. You're constantly negative. Stay away from those kind of people. Avoid them. Pretty strong language in Romans 16, 16. If, 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 you're, if you have somebody in the church that's trying to cause division, and God has been really good to us here. We've been here 20, almost 20 years. The church has been in existence. We've never had a split. We've never had big problems here. And, and we have tried to stay unified for the most part. And I think a lot of that is because people have practiced biblical stuff here, and somebody comes and they're trying to cause division and trying to cause trouble then then people avoid them. That's a biblical thing. I'm not going the road you're going down, man. Okay, it means taking a stand, all right? So so all of these are verses that, uh, Galatians 1, 8, 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that we preach to you, let him be accursed. Now that's really strong language. You got somebody stands up and says, the way to heaven is through your works. What, what, Paul says in Galatians is, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So there is a time where we have to make a judgment. The problem in what James is talking about is, it is a mistake to make a judgment based on 10 seconds. 
So you look at somebody and they appear to have it all together, right? Their shirt's pressed, their jeans are pressed, look sharp, hair's combed. We're like, that's a good guy. You got no idea whether that's a good guy or not. None. But you make a judgment call based on the external. And a lot of times, I'll tell you this, the more somebody many times looks like they have it put together, the more a mess they are on the inside. But what we do is we make a judgment call. So somebody pulls in, they drive in the Mercedes, they get out in their Armani suit, they walk into church, and the leadership goes, hey, want to sit here on the front row? We have a seat just for you. What are we doing? We're making a judgment call. I love the, you know, I love the story of how Walmart got going and, and uh, Sam Walton, who founded Walmart. You know, the guy was a, from the country, guy from Arkansas, you know. And so what he'd do is once these stores would get going, he would get in his old pickup, put on his overalls, drive to the store, and see how they treated him when he walked in. Because he wanted, he wanted the guy that had the overalls and drove into the truck to to feel comfortable in the store and be respected in the store. And uh, sadly, I think since the guy has died, they've kind of gone away from that a little bit. But that was kind of the model early. Like, he's like, I don't want there to be a respecter of persons in Walmart. I don't want, I don't want people to be treated poorly because they don't look like us. Here's one of the richest guys in the world. They've walked in the room. You'd be like, I, he don't look like a rich guy. But why do we make a judgment call on somebody? Oh, man, they got purple hair. You see all them tattoos? We're making judgment calls. We don't even know. We've never even spoke to the person. We're making a call. That's a terrible thing to do. James says, how do you treat people? You don't make a judgment call until you know them. You spend time with them. You, you get to know them. You hear their story. You listen to them out. Now, there may come a point where you're like, look, man, I, I can't hang with you because you're this way. But you don't make a judgment call based on the outside. God doesn't look at people like that. And we shouldn't look at them like that either. So you don't make a judgment call in seconds. You make a judgment call in hours. You make a judgment call in days and months. That's where you make judgment calls, not in seconds. And I know some of you got jobs and you got to make decisions quickly. And I get all of that. And, and I think that we need to watch our behavior and so forth. But boy, we need to be careful in the church to kind of label people early. Don't make judgment calls quickly, not only in the church, but outside the church as well. So then what does he say in verse number five? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So number three, what's he saying? He's saying, how do I treat people? One is, I do what? I treat people the way who treated them, church? I treat them the way Jesus did. Two, I don't make judgments how? Quickly. I, I, I get to know the person before I make a judgment on them. Three, the third thing is I value people's faith and character. What James is saying is value people's faith and character. When God was speaking to Samuel about anointing a king, and remember, he, the people, why did they pick Saul? They picked Saul because he was the best looking. They said there was nobody in Israel that was as good a looking as Saul. And there was nobody taller than him. So this is what he was. He was tall, dark, and handsome. Right? And the people said, that's who we want as our king. He had terrible character. So they made a mistake. So God had to start all over. So he's telling Samuel, I want you to go to this guy's house, and I want you to pick out one of his kids. And this is what he said. This is what he said to him. Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Jesse called Ahinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And you know, he goes through all of his boys, and he finally looks at Jesse and says, you got any more kids? Well, he goes, I got one. He's out watching sheep. David? David walks in the room and God says, that's the guy. 
That's the guy. Was not based on, he was the last of the brothers. He was the one with the lowest potential, but he was the one that God used. Because why? Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 1 Peter 3 is a verse, uh, is kind of, Peter is talking to women here, and he's talking about that how women ought to look. He says, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward. He goes, there's nothing wrong with dressing up on the outside. There's nothing wrong with putting nice clothes on. There's nothing wrong with makeup and wearing jewelry. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't let that be your focus to the neglect of the internal. So he says, so he, he, he says what the out, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. So he says, ladies, rather let it be the inward person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now listen to what he says, which is very precious in the sight of God. See, we look externally. God looks at the heart. We look at the outside. And this is indications that we are very shallow people because this is what we focus on, is the outside. There's three parts to every human, body, soul, And spirit. Body is what you see that is in a constant process of deterioration. Soul is kind of my personality. It's how I interact with people. It's kind of this, it's it's, uh, my attitude. It's it's the inward part. Spiritual, soul and spirit. Spirit is that relationship to God. Can I tell you what people do that's crazy? They pick mates just based on the body. Nuts! That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. Because if you just pick a wife or a husband based on how hot they are, they don't look so hot when you find out who they are. And if they're very ugly on the inside, that cannot be masked with prettiness on the outside. But that's not what our culture says. We, we, we size everybody up based on their external. So gyms are packed and weight loss programs because we got to look a certain part. And let me, let me, I hate to break it to all of you, especially you young people, whoever you marry, they ain't going to look like that in 50 years. Right? Somebody said 20 years. Somebody said five years. <laughs> the guy with the six pack abs is going to be sitting on the couch rubbing his fat belly in about 45 or 47, whatever age I am now. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just, we change. We change. Years ago, Karen, Karen does not hate this story, so I'm not, I'm just telling you the truth. So there, nobody will laugh at this, but we laugh at it all the time. One of the funniest things ever happened in our house is we brought somebody into our house, and we're showing them our house, and we used to, we, we, we lived on 36th Street on the east side of town. Now we live up north, but our first house. And so we had this, above our bed, we had our wedding pictures. So this lady went to our church, walks into the room, looks at the wedding pictures, says, oh, Pastor Mark, you look so young and Karen was so thin. <laughs> and it was just scared that I just laughed out loud right there. So apparently now I'm an old dude walking around and Karen's blowed up, you know, so. uh, Because that's what we we identify that, right? We, We focus on the external. But can I tell you what? God doesn't look at the external. He looks at the heart. A rich man, and what James is saying here is, you can, oh, this person's rich. This person's so, uh, he's got so much money. Look, if this guy is not a man of faith and a man of character, he will torment you. He will torment you. He will take you into the courts. He'll, he'll act nice to you, and then he'll loan you some money, and then he'll say it's a gift, and then he'll demand it back, and he'll drag you into the courts. And he goes, isn't it the rich that are oppressing you? Why are you bending over backwards to be nice to them? And the problem, he says, is you're not valuing people of faith and character. Look, there are some of the poorest people that I've ever met are some of the most godly people I've ever met. 
But some of the poorest people I've ever met are some of the biggest jerks I've ever met. You don't judge a man based on his poverty. Do you understand that some of us are destined to be poor? Do you know it's not bad to be poor? We think it's the worst thing that could possibly happen to me is I could be poor. In fact, in some ways, it stinks to be rich more than to be poor. Because rich, we think we can buy our way out of everything. When you're poor, you look at God and you go, help? Help me? You don't look to your bank account. You look to God. So what he's saying is, don't value people just based on their, uh, their level of money. Value people based on their faith and character. Isn't that what, that's what Martin Luther King said, right? Man should be judged not by, the, uh, not by his external, but by the content of his character. He, he longed for his kids to be judged by that. Not based on the color of their skin, but the content of their character. I knew I'd get it eventually. But he's saying, I want, I want people to value people's faith and character, not what they look like on the outside. And we have to understand that God is perfectly impartial. He treats people with absolute equality based simply and only on the internal condition of the soul, not on the external circumstances. This may hurt some of you, but God doesn't care one bit how you look. He doesn't care how you dress. He doesn't care how much money you have or don't have. He doesn't care about your education or where you went to school. He doesn't care about your social standing. He doesn't care about your prestige. He doesn't care about your race. He doesn't care about any of that. That's all absolutely inconsequential to God. He is indifferent to all of that. And when the church treats people in that regard, it is, it is appalling to me that there was a time in our country where we judged people based on the color of their skin. How could we read the Bible? How could we read the book of James chapter 2 and say, that's okay? It's not okay. You know, Jesus didn't come into the world in a rich man's house. You know that? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then after having been born in Bethlehem, the city of David, which was disregarded, he had the choice of where to live. You know where God had Jesus, the Son of God, live? In Nazareth. Nazareth was a nobody town. In fact, when they heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, and they heard him teaching in the temple, this is what they said. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Topeka? I mean, you have to be from Kansas City, right? Or Chicago, or Miami, or Los Angeles, or you, you can't. I mean, that's really where you make a difference in the world is from the big city, and, and, and the mecca of all, New York, correct? I mean, this is where you make the biggest difference because this is where if you have a church there and you pastor there, then you're somebody. God doesn't look at it that way. God looks at some little guy pastoring in some little podunk town who's just doing his best for the Lord, and that is of great value to God. God looks at your heart. He looks at your character, not what you look like on the outside. And can I tell you the truth? Most of us in this room would probably be disappointed if we saw Jesus. Because I hate to break it to you, Jesus wasn't six foot five with long flowing blonde hair and six pack abs and broad shoulders. And he didn't, he, 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 you know what the Bible says about him? He was an ordinary looking guy. I mean, if you'd seen Jesus, you'd been like, that's the Son of God? Because that's not how I pictured him. Paul, who was the, who was the greatest uh, apostle, in a sense, he made the greatest, he was the first missionary. Paul was nothing to look at. In fact, he was an incredibly boring speaker. A guy fell asleep, sat down, he spoke so long, a guy fell asleep, fell off, the, broke his neck. Much like I'm, it's 11.47, I'm losing some of you. <laughs> no, I, you get the point. God doesn't look at the external. We look at somebody, how they speak and how they talk and how they look, and we say, oh, God can really use that one. No, God looks at the heart. Now, you can be a person that has good looks and has personality, and God can use you. I mean, you don't know trash yourself. I'm going to look ugly. 
I'm going to look as disgusting as I can. That's not the point. The point is, is we get too focused on the external. Are you working on your heart? Are you working on the inside? Like, how much time do you spend at the gym working your body to look a certain way versus how much time you spend in the Word of God growing your character, growing your spiritual life? Which do you value more? Which do you make more of a priority in your life? Because the inside is what matters, not the outside. The outside changes. 30 years from now, I'm going to look nothing like I look today. But my character can get more beautiful and more beautiful, and my relationship with God can get closer and closer. Those are things that can grow. This body, I'm trying to do everything I can to stop it, and it ain't working. It's in the process of deterioration. Let me quickly give you these last two. Verse 8 says this, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. Now, now, what he goes on to describe is, then he talks about two of the greatest commandments, adultery and murder. Those are kind of like we look at sin, and not all sin is the same, but we look at sin and we say, okay, of the 10 commandments, these are the two worst that you can commit, adultery and murder. Okay, so we look at that, we go, it's disgusting that somebody would cheat on somebody, and it's disgusting that somebody would murder somebody. But what we do is, is we kind of wink at partiality. And, and what James is saying is, look, partiality is sin. Let me read a couple of verses for you. Proverbs 17, 15. He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. You ever made fun of the poor? You ever mock the poor? You're mocking one of God's kids. Now, how would it go over well with you if somebody mocked your kids? You know, your kid takes after you. Maybe you got a big nose or you got big ears. And you know, and so, so somebody walks up to your kid and says, look at the big nose kid. How would you respond as a parent? Oh, you're so funny. Or you'd want to punch him in the face. I mean, we don't deal, I don't deal well with kids mocking, with people mocking my kids. Do you, do you do well with that? Am I the only one in the room that gets fired up about this? No, but you know what? Your kids look like you. We, we, we have the same genes. So God has some people that have been born poor, and if we mock the poor, if you stand in line at Walmart and you mock that person that's using their card because they don't have the money you have, the Bible says, he who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. That's a pretty powerful word. What James is doing here is he is reminding us partiality is sin. And I want to tell you right now, if you discriminate based on somebody's riches or poverty, if you discriminate based on somebody's skin color or where they're from, or they don't speak the same language that you do, or however you discriminate against somebody, you are sinning. It is a sin to be a racist. It is a sin to discriminate. It is a sin to show favoritism. And James can't put it in any stronger language than he does here. It is not acceptable in the eyes of God. And it should be eliminated from the Christian church. Every race, every person, both poor and rich, both black and white, both Spanish and American, Whatever they are should be welcomed in our church with open arms. And to, do, to not accept people is to discriminate, is to show favoritism, and it is a sin in the sight of Almighty God. Number five, the fifth thing. James says this in verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Number five. How should I treat people? Always err on the side of mercy. Always err on the side of mercy. You know who people, who the people are that are, give out the most grace? The people that give out the most grace should be those have, that have received the most grace. 
And that's in a sense what he's saying here. He's saying, look, show people some mercy. Show people some grace. Give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, we, one, somebody messes up one time and we cut them off. We're done with them. But aren't you glad that Jesus didn't cut you off after the first time you failed him? Are you with me, church? How many times in your life has God shown you mercy? You don't want what you deserve. Somebody in our family recently got a ticket. (laughs) And there was a great bemoaning of the fact that they got a ticket. So normally, I am not the voice of reason in our family. I'm the voice of panic. But I just reminded this individual that aren't you glad you haven't got a ticket every time you sped? Right? (laughs) I'm not making eye, and I'm not talking about my wife, for those of you that are wondering. (laughs) Aren't you glad God hadn't punished you every time you've done something wrong? Aren't you glad he has been over and abundant in his grace and mercy and kindness to you? Maybe, maybe you ought to forgive that person that wronged you. Because maybe what they need now, then, then they need to be punished, is they need somebody to show them a little bit of grace. Maybe at this point, they don't need to be, they don't need to suffer shame. They just need to experience love from somebody who loves them unconditionally. Maybe. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying that you have to do it. But I'm saying I want you to think about it. We want people to show us mercy, but we want everybody to pay for what they've done to us. It doesn't work that way. If you have been showed great mercy, then you ought to show others great mercy. If you have been shown great grace, then you should give that away. I've regretted a lot of things in my life, and maybe the greatest regrets that I have is when I was too hard on people. You know, I made judgment calls, and I was too hard, and I have a lot of regrets, and if there's a lot of things I go back and wish I could do different, is just to be more loving and gracious with people. And let me tell you, you'll never regret giving people another chance, showing them some grace, showing them some mercy. Now, there comes a point, obviously, where you have to make the judgment call and enough's enough, but I just love Jesus going to Peter, right? He's setting, he's, he's, he's giving up. I'll never, God will never use me again. Went back to fishing. And I love Jesus showing up and said, Peter, you love me. Now, you denied me three times about two days ago. Do you love me, Peter? Well, yes, Lord, I love you. Then go feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know, he asked him three times. Everybody always talks about, why did he ask him three times? Well, I think he's given him three chances to undo what he did. Because you can see Peter almost getting to, yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then go feed my sheep. So my challenge for you today is let's, let's treat people right. Everybody needs Jesus. And everybody needs a place where they can come. And in that place, they feel love. And I pray to God that this will be that place. Where people come in here and they're just loved. Loved. Because why? We're doing what the Bible says. 